All right, so going back to what we talked about last week in here, we talked about hypertonic and hypotonic. If, in theory, you had a dialysis bag that had a 0.5 molar solution in it and you put it into pure water, assuming that only water can pass, should that bag gain weight or lose weight? Good, it should gain weight. The bag should gain. The reason why this bag should, so if we put the bag in here, the bag should gain weight because this would be hypotonic. The solution would be hypotonic to the bag. Also, if you're asked to graph and they give you water as one of your things, some people thought, oh, I must, I must have to make a bar graph because water is not a number. Water is a number in this case. Water is zero molar. So water would be the zero point on your graph. So in theory, if we were to calculate the percent change in mass, we know that in pure water, it would be some positive number. At some point in part three of the lab, you're going to be asked to make a graph in your notebook. Your graph is going to look something like this, which is a little different than most of the graphs we've made in this class. Notice how here's our molarity on our x-axis, and notice the percent change on our y, that zero is here. Because if something lost weight, you're going to have negative numbers. And if it gained weight, you're going to have positive numbers. So we could assume that the percent change would be for zero molar over here would probably be, let's just say, somewhere up here. Let's just assume this is the percent change for bag A. With me so far? Let's say I now put the bag, a similar bag, same solution, into solution B. What should I expect to happen if I put this bag into solution B that's 0.5 molar? Awesome. It should stay the same because what kind of solution is this? Right. It would be equilibrium and an isotonic solution. So water would tend to go in and out at the same rate. And we can assume that in the 0.5 molar, we should get pretty much no change. The bag would stay the same. How about if we put our 0.5 molar bag into a 1 molar solution? Now our bag should lose weight because this is now a hypertonic solution and our bag would lose weight. So I would probably get some number, let's just say down here. And I could actually graph this, and I would get something like this. So in 0.5 molar, anything, technically, even though I didn't test it, technically I could have put that bag in anything from 0 to 0.5, and it should have gained weight. However, if I put it in, let's just say, a 0.3 molar solution, would I expect it to gain as much weight as when I put it in pure water? No, because it's not as extreme of a difference, right? So it would gain less. In other words, we could predict how much weight it would gain or lose in each of the different solutions. The more hypertonic the solution is, the more weight the bag would lose. If I put it in two molar, I would expect that bag to lose even more weight. Um, I can't get, obviously I can't get any more pure than pure water. So that would be the gaining the most. So in part three of the lab, if you look at the backboard, we now have class totals. What we did in the lab in part three was basically this. We took a potato. We did not know the molarity of the potato, but we did know it was somewhere between zero and 1.0 molar. Now, based on the data on the board, we know, we just said that if our potato has a molarity somewhere in the middle here, what should happen to the potato in pure water? a couple people mumbling. Our potato in pure water should gain the most weight. Therefore, looking at the backboard, which color must have been the pure water? Purple must have been the pure water. It gained 24.6%. And make sure you get that data at some point. So we know purple was pure water. In which color did it gain a little bit less than that? Yellow. So yellow must have been our point two. What would be next if we're putting them in order? Green, because now in green, it started to lose. Which one must have been the 1.0, the most concentrated solution? Orange, right? Because it lost the most in orange. So even though I color-coded the solutions, you can figure out which one was which based on what happened to the potato. Now, were any of the solutions isotonic to the potato? 
Was there a solution there where it didn't gain or lose anything? No. But wouldn't it be true that if you put these in order, you know that it gained in, in what was it, yellow, and then it lost in green. If you graph your data, which it's going to ask you to do, it's going to ask you to put your solutions in order, and then it's going to ask you to graph them. Wouldn't it be true that when you graph it, you're going to get some kind of a graph that looks like this, and at some point, it's going to cross the x-axis. Does that make sense? So even though we did not actually have a solution that was isotonic to the, to the potato, we could predict what molarity would be isotonic to the potato from our graph. Wherever it crosses the x-axis, that would be the molarity that we would expect to be isotonic. We could predict what the molarity of the potatoes were based on where it crosses somewhere in here. You'll have to make a better graph than me. But we can see that it crosses somewhere in here. So it's going to ask you in the lab to graph the data, and it's going to ask you what was the molarity of the potatoes. Predict what you think the molarity of the potatoes was. That's how you would figure it out. You would basically make a graph, and wherever it crosses, you predict what molarity that is. That's going to be what, what we would predict to be isotonic, because that's where the potatoes technically shouldn't have gained or lost weight. Even though none of the solutions we chose were actually isotonic, we can figure out between which molarities would be isotonic. I would say I would say you could go even to the hundreds. You could try from your graph to go to the hundreds place on this. All right. So does that make sense so far for part three? Because that's the first thing that you need to understand. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about, and this goes along with part three also, is a formula. This formula is on the formula sheet. It's called water potential. It looks scary. It's like a pitchfork or trident or something. That's the Greek letter psi. It stands for water potential. The formula sheet has this formula, and the formula sheet, which of course you always are provided with, tells you what each of these things stands for. So this, uh, this is water potential. Water potential is equal to what's called solute potential, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, plus what's called pressure potential. Pressure potential is a measure of how much pressure is, is pushing on something. Again, this formula is on the formula sheet and they tell you what all the letters stand for. There's a couple things they don't tell you. The first thing that you need to know is if you're trying to determine which way water will go, water will always go towards the lower water potential. So if you were given two water potentials and asked which way will water go, choose the smaller number. That's the way the water's going to go, which seems confusing to people because that's sort of the opposite of the hypertonic hypotonic thing. When you look at concentration in hypertonic, water always goes towards hypertonic. But if you're looking at water potentials, water will always go towards the lower water potential. So solute potential has to do with how much solute is in the water. Solute, obviously water tends to go towards where there's more solute. Pressure has to do with pushing on it, and I'll show you a, an example of this on the next slide. But if you imagine that you have a, like a YouTube, one of these YouTubes, and you have a lot of solute on this side, we know that based on solute, water should go towards the right, based on what we talked about before. But imagine if I put a plunger here and created pressure so that nothing could go to the right because there was nowhere for the water to rise. This is sort of like what's happening in plant cells. When you put them in hypotonic, they don't explode. They just get really like a water balloon, and they can't flow up anymore. That's pressure. So if we have a lot of pressure, we may be able to prevent water from passing. So that's why water potential, sort of the, um, the direction water is going to go, is going to be dependent on two things. How much solute there is in the solution, and secondly, how much pressure there is pushing on it. So the first kind of problem that you might get is super easy. It says, what is the water potential if the solute potential is negative 12 bars and the pressure potential is 8 bars? Which brings me to one other thing. The units for water potential are always going to be bars, which is a weird sounding unit. But you may think, um, like when they talk about hurricanes and the weather, sometimes they'll talk about, oh, the pressure in the middle of the hurricane is such and such millibars. Bar is a unit. Um, you don't hear it used that often, but that is the unit that's used for water potential. So you always want to make sure you include your units. 
So what is the water potential? Like I said in our first problem, you would literally do this. So water potential is equal to solute potential plus pressure potential. So it would literally be negative 12 bars plus 8 bars, which means our water potential would be negative 4 bars. That does not tell us which way water is going to go. That's just the number. But if you knew what, what the other side of a membrane had, then you could predict which way water would go. Water will always go towards whichever side, again, has the lower water potential. So look at the second problem. The second problem says what is the solute potential if the water potential is 2.5 bars and the pressure potential is 4.1. So this time, They're asking for this. So we know to get solute potential by itself, it would basically be water potential minus pressure. Does that make sense? These are really not hard problems. So the solute potential would simply be 2.5 minus 4.1, which would give us what? Negative 1.6. Agree? Disagree? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Thank you. Remember, units are bars. All right. Look at the next one. If inside of a cell has a water potential of 2.5 bars, it's placed in an environment where the water potential is negative 1.0 bars, which way will water travel? So should water go into the cell or out of the cell based on what I told you about water potential? The answer is water will go out of the cell because water always goes towards the lower water potential. Again, it seems contradictory, but I'll show you how it comes together. So try the last one yourself. It says that they give you the solute and the pressure inside, and they give you the solute and the pressure outside. So what you have to do is calculate the water potential inside, calculate the water potential outside using the formula, and then determine which way water will go. So try that one. All right, so inside the cell, what did you get? So negative 2.3 bars inside. Outside, negative 1.2. Water is going to go towards the lower number. Therefore, which way will water go? In. So the water will go into the cell. 